We're back, guys. Um, so the conversation today, I want to, before we get into it, I want to kind of like ask a couple questions. Like if something were to happen and we we're at home, right? Let's say it's a worst case scenario, our heart were to stop and EMS were to show up, what would they do, right? We talked about that a little bit last time. Um, and if that were to happen, what I want to kind of talk about today, two, two pieces, is one, what that could look like, right? And we talked about the post form last time. We're going to reiterate it this time. Um, and then also, if something else were to happen, what, what other paperwork do we need to have in order um, in the legal side beyond just having the medical documentation? So I think this is going to have a little bit of two different pieces. So just a um, reminder, my name's uh, Ryan Odom. I'm a family med doc. Um, my experience goes back into teaching family medicine from birth to grave. Um, so I used to deliver babies, and I also would work in the ICU um, in the residency. I've shifted more to clinic work now, but I've had over 12 years of experience in that kind of broad spectrum of care, which gives me a really unique perspective to help kind of help people with these discussions. Um, and then um, Brian Bean's a local attorney here. Um, that's going to introduce himself in a little bit as well, but he'll be able to give some perspective on the legal side as well. Um, so, if something like that were to happen, before we get into it, I want to introduce somebody. This is Lisa. Um, she was a patient I used to take care of um, back in Las Vegas. And Lisa, I actually met her after she had a DVT, which is a blood clot in her leg. Um, it went to her lungs and she got really short of breath and came to the hospital. While she was there, we diagnosed her with, with ovarian cancer. That's what we thought it was at the time. I then had the opportunity to work with her over the next two years. Um, as she transitioned from trying to get to do everything um, to when she passed. Um, it was a really unique opportunity. And there's those people in your life that you meet that you'll always remember. Um, and after I'd left Las Vegas, her husband actually let me know when she'd passed and everything. So I'd really gotten an opportunity to develop a close relationship with the family. One of the things that we always discussed when she was in the hospital, because even when we first had the diagnosis of the cancer, her question was, what does this mean? How long do I have, right? I'm not an oncologist. I don't know. And honestly, oncologists don't truly know either. They have statistics, um, but they don't know how things are going to progress. So I would ask the question, what do you want out of your life? What is your expectation and what brings meaning to it? Because no matter how you look at it, you're 50. You probably have more time behind you than you have in front of you. And you need to make what time you have here important to you. Now, when you have a cancer diagnosis, that becomes a lot more pertinent. Um, and it seems much more real. Um, but it was the same question that I was asking with her. Now, as we discussed over time, um, her tr care plan transitioned. She initially was, I want everything done. As her cancer did not respond to therapy, she was working with her oncologist, she started having some shifts in her desires and what she wanted. Um, and eventually, um, she decided that she did not want to be intubated, and she had um, a pneumonia that led to her passing. Um, however, I want to talk about something else that kind of is the next piece. Like, if she was at home and she had that blood clot, maybe it had a severe effect on her heart, right, um, to where she actually passed out, and EMS were to show up. What would they want to see to know what she would have wanted? How would they know if she was DNR or DNI? when they showed up. So in Idaho, that form, when they show up, is called the post form. And there's a couple different pieces on the post form. Um, it does have a little bit of a living will in it, in a medical durable power of attorney and what you'd want done in the hospital. But the piece that they want to see is up here at the top, which is do not resuscitate or resuscitate, that being the full code or not. Now, the challenge in a situation where the EMS shows up is they don't know what caused somebody to go down, right? All they can do is evaluate somebody and say, do they have a pulse or not? And if they don't have a pulse and it says do not resuscitate, they don't do anything. So this is a tricky spot when you're having that conversation of what we want done. Because if it was something that was reversible, right? Let's say it was the blood clot and they did CPR, and they got her in the hospital, there's a lot of ifs here, and she received the right medication, it might save her life. But we don't know. Or maybe she has something called V-fib or V-tac, 
the heart rate or the heart is pumping in a way that's not compatible with life, but an electric shock kapoom, could reset it, and then it could be compatible with life. Do not resuscitate means don't do that. So it's tricky. And the reason I bring this up is when EMS shows up, they have that, it's just a binary decision, resuscitate or not resuscitate. And if someone doesn't have a pulse and they say DNR, they let someone pass naturally. And it's okay. Or if the option is they want everything done, then they can do it. Now, that comes into the living will and what next steps are. And that's really complicated. And that's why these papers are really important. So coming into the next piece is like what intervention somebody would want. That is the living will, right? And that's the most brief living will you could possibly have. Um, to try to condense somebody's entire care into three sentences is really hard. They try to do a decent job. Um, and this, this kind of summarizes very large scope concepts of care, broken down specifically into comfort measures, limited interventions, and aggressive interventions. Aggressive interventions will be the full bore ICU press, getting everything done. Um, that would include like a ventilator support. Limited interventions would generally be things not going to the ICU, so floor level care. And that could vary depending on what somebody's wishes were. Comfort measures would be saying specifically, I know I might die. I would rather be comfortable and that's okay. Don't wake me up. Don't give me IVs. Don't give me central lines. You can give me some oral antibiotics or maybe some IV antibiotics. Um, but I don't want extreme measures taken. And that's just kind of the range there. Um, section three talks about fluid and nutrition. If somebody be okay with a feeding tube, um, antibiotics or blood products, if that's something somebody's okay with or not. And this is getting into some of the details on what somebody's care would be. Last time we talked about um, the five wishes. I think that's a much more in-depth opportunity to discuss what this is. Um, and it can also act as a living will. This is the most brief of documents trying to communicate the same information. Um, on the bottom of it, it does talk about ad advanced directives, which is that living will, which is really useful. So if you have that and be able to check that, then you they know to look for it. Um, it also has a DPAHC, which is a durable power of attorney healthcare. Um, and that's really useful as well. Because if you have assigned a durable power of attorney for your healthcare, and let's say you said, I want everything done by EMS, but then they, then they your durable power of attorney comes and says, you know what, you want everything done, but if the, you know, if he's intimated and doesn't get better in a day, he doesn't want to keep going. Or maybe she wants everything done no matter what, right? And they have that perspective. So that's really useful because they act as your advocate. So that's what this is about. This is actually, so the post stands for power, oh wait, so physician orders of scope of treatment. And so at the bottom of it, it should actually be signed by a provider um, and the patient or the patient's surrogate stating what they want. And then this would normally be stored on your refrigerator. Um, we have some copies of it in yellow, so it's available so that it's very easy to see. Um, if you have people coming over like kids, you don't want it, you can write post on the outside of an envelope and have it there, but it's a good thing to have on the fridge. And EMS is trained to look for it there. All right. so. Um, we talked about what the medical power of attorney is. If you don't have the medical power of attorney where we have somebody lined up, we, start, we talked about this last time, but we kind of go through who would be responsible and be able to help you out or make decisions for you. In the ideal scenario, um, you make your own decisions, but if you can't, the person who has the highest authority would be somebody that the court says, you're in charge of this person's care when they can't care for themselves. That generally happens when there's nobody else available or somebody's that we don't know who they are and that we need someone to help make decisions. The next person is the medical power of attorney and this is the ideal scenario where you make those decision, the decision on who would represent you. After that, um, the default would be your spouse. Um, it's a wife because I'm a male, but it would be either way. Um, next would be your adult children, your parents. It's really awkward when they might disagree. So that power of attorney really helps then any other responsible adult that might be related to you would make a decision. And finally, if someone says, yeah, I know that person and we're friends and they've talked to me about it. Um, because we really want to have somebody that has, that knows you that can give some perspective. 
And if it's a friend, it'd be much better to make your friend your medical power of attorney if that's who you wanted to do that. Um, in a couple scenarios, um, for instance, if somebody has a same-sex marriage, um, if they don't have a medical power of attorney in their state where the, that marriage isn't recognized, they may be trumped by family members. So the medical power of attorney is really important, especially in unique circumstances like that. And then if nobody else is there, we make the call. Um, and that's pretty much, we're gonna say we're gonna do everything up until um, either the court has appointed somebody or we've gone to the point where it's no longer gonna be helping them live a quality life. That would be if they didn't have a case form. Right, so the, the physician's the worst case, worst case scenario. We're gonna do everything we can to save somebody. If somebody falls on the street, they're a Jane Doe or John Doe and no one knows who they are, EMS picks them up, brings them in, and they can't make decisions for themselves, physicians will make decisions. Um, we're gonna do everything we can to help extend their life, um, to make significant decisions that require procedures. It takes two physicians to agree that this, this um, procedure is necessary. Um, so it's not just any physician making the decisions, but it's the care team providing that care. Um, it's not an easy situation. Oftentimes, the physician is going to push for more um, because we don't have what their opinion would be. Do you have a bracelet, DNR? If you had a bracelet that was DNR and it's seen, hopefully it'll be honored. It's not a physician order statement like the post form. Um, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, if it were to come into the hospital and there was a physician there and they saw a DNR bracelet and the patient was unable to represent themselves, that gets into not a hard spot because then you might be talking about withdrawing care based on a bracelet. We would try to reach out to family and figure out what the wishes were first, of course. Um, yeah. So just kind of summarizing it, living will, medical directives, medical power, or medical health care proxies, advanced health care directives. These are all the same words for saying what you would want done if you're in a spot where you weren't able to make those decisions for yourself. And they're really important because um, they allow you to have that decision on how you get to direct your care when you're not actually able to make those decisions at the time. So it's a really useful moment. Um, but I'm going to kind of transition. Those are the main documents that we talk about. But I'm going to have um, Mr. Brian Bean come up and talk. He's going to um, give us some of the legal side. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, sir. Oh, here. Thanks. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Is that on? It is on. Hey, thank you, doctor. Um, I know you're all thinking tonight. Who invited the lawyer? I'll, I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. And, and I, uh, I was thinking about it on the way here, what my goal is, and, and it's to impress upon you how easy it is to get this documentation done and why not do it. Um, so again, my name is Brian Bean. I'm an estate planning attorney here in Coeur d'Alene, I practice with my father. His firm is called Charles Bean and Associates. I also do real estate law, um, and I've been doing estate planning oh, since I graduated from Gonzaga in, in 2010. Um, I love the process of working with uh, family members that we do estate planning with. Um, our estate plans consist of a few different components. So we, we ordinarily have a last will and testament, we have, or a last will and testament and a trust. We have a durable power of attorney, which affects things like your business decisions, bank accounts, um, things of that nature. And then we also have the living will component, uh, which I think about as being the health directive and the medical power of attorney. Um, it's very rare that when you come to us and do an estate plan that um, you walk out without a medical power of attorney and that health directive. Um, from a legal standpoint, uh, I was researching the statute and going back over it again today. It is governed by the uh, Medical Consent and Natural Death Act that our current version was codified back in 2005. And then it's, there's been some amendments along the way. And digging into the reasons for why we have this, um, Back then, they started to identify that, hey, we've got this medical technology and these advancements that um, can keep you alive for a really long time. 
um, if, if they want to. And so the idea behind giving you this ability to sign a living will, execute a living will, and execute a, a medical power of attorney is to preserve your right and, and your consent at a time when you are no longer able to. So when I do my medical power of attorneys or uh, when I do the health directives, um, I, well, let me back up and say that. So that the health directive is a document saying that you know, in the event that your incapacity cannot communicate your wishes, then this is the type of treatment that you want, as Dr. Odom discussed. The medical power of attorney, on the other hand, is granting that agent um, the, the authority to make any healthcare-related decisions, any treatment-related decisions, either when you become incapacitated or it's effective immediately. I used to do it where it didn't become effective and the health agent didn't have authority until you became incapacitated. And then I realized that just in the situations where we had to prove that somebody was incapacitated, that could be a, a challenging process. So my recommendation has been um, if you've got a spouse or somebody that you trust and you know um, who will make the right decisions on your behalf and you've had those important conversations with, just give it to them right right then. Sign the document and, and give them that authority. So my process, again, is when anybody comes into my office is we will help you with your estate documents. Um, we will walk you through the differences between those documents. One of the biggest misconceptions is um, a living will is also a last will and testament. So they're, they're two very different things and, and a, they're probably a month doesn't go by that that doesn't come up. So we walk through everything and then we discuss the type of treatment that, that you would like. Um, but again, going back to my ultimate goal here is that these are very easy to get access to. Um, myself and a number of colleagues um, are usually more than willing to provide the forms to you for free. Um, or if you want to sit down and spend time with us walking through them, we also recommend that you consult your doctor about it and discuss those types of decisions that you're going to want to be making when you fill out that, that health directive. Um, I think, I, where's the clicker? Oh, okay. Okay, so we went through, again, we went through the statute, and again, um, the intent was the legislature started recognizing that we have the technology to preserve your life for a significant amount of time, and that may not be your, your desire. So with the living will or medical power of attorney, it gives you the authority to ensure that your consent and your wishes are, are carried out. So without that, as Dr. Odom discussed, you're going to be left to that hierarchy of decision making. I can tell you um, in meeting with lots and lots of families that there are some that are comfortable being in that position. And it's not always the spouse. Sometimes it's a, 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 a child or um, a sibling that maybe they have a background or they're just more comfortable in that type of role when it's obviously a very emotional time as well. So let's see. I just have a few slides here. It looks like I already went through all of this. Um, the only other thing that I will mention that um, on the estate planning side is that like a power of attorney and for healthcare and the, the, the living will, doing a just a simple will is a very easy step. Um, and so if you don't do something like that, like the living will and healthcare power of attorney, your loved ones are going to be left deciding what to do with your state, kind of like with your, your health or your, your remains. So um, my recommendation is to um, you know, seek somebody out that can provide that counsel and can help you with those estate docs uh, documents. Um, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. And, and most folks in town will do a free consultation 
Um, and so it's, it's, it's easy to do. And I've got some, some paperwork up there as well if you'd like to um, access that. Um, any, any questions? Okay. All right. Well, I hope that just touches on everything a little bit. I hope that's helpful. Feel free to catch me afterwards. I can answer any other specific questions that you may have. I thought it would be great idea for us to hang out at the same time. <laughs>